And good evening, this is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the podcast. And in this podcast tonight, I'm going to be doing an interview with the co-founder of the knife manufacturing company, Delta 2 Alpha. And his name is Ace. He goes by the name Ace. And this company is a very, very interesting company. It was started a few years back by Ace and his business partner, Dante. And I only found out about these guys maybe about a year ago, year and a half. And I really like the story. I like the story of how they thought up their company, how they went about making the designs, how they traveled to Italy to actually begin the knife manufacturing business, you know, what their guiding principles were, what their guiding philosophies for philosophies were, what challenges they faced. Because this is a real company. This is not just some fly-by-night operation. This is an actual company that manufactures a great product. And I have no connection to these guys. I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I, uh, I'm really interested in what they're doing and in the, uh, the business side of their story. And I think we can all learn from it. I just love, I love these business success stories. I love these stories about how people take something from an idea to germination and then to, to uh, fruition. So the the name of their website it's it's delta2alpha.com that's spelled a d e l t a the number 2 and then alpha a l p h a.com and these guys I mean I'll you'll you'll hear the interview and and uh hear him talk about his philosophy but basically what I liked about it is they started out with a great principle they they chose a product that they really passionate about they decided to make it better than anybody else was doing and they didn't compromise on quality or materials or anything like that. And I think there's a lot to be learned in this day and age of fly-by-night and you know playing it cheap and uh, cutting corners and, and that sort of mentality. So I'm going to see if I can get Ace here on the phone. And if you can just bear with me here for a second, I will do that and we will start the interview. And we are back here. This is Quintus Curtius, and welcome back to the podcast. I have with me Ace, the co co owner or co founder of Delta Two Alpha line of uh, knives and and gear. Ace, are you there? Can you hear me? I got you loud and clear. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your coming on the podcast here. And you know, I I, I wanted to. I'm really glad that you had the time to speak with us because. You know, I've, uh, you know, I got your T-shirt. <laughs> I wear it to the gym all the time. I get a lot of questions on it. It's got the, a very interesting design. It's got this circle with this arrowhead in the middle, and I guess it all means something. Uh, I guess there's some hidden symbolism in there. But, you know, what I, what I really wanted to talk to you about was maybe just, you know, you can talk a little bit about how you guys came to found this company. What Sort of vision you had for and how you went about doing that. What's the what? What does Delta Two do? Let's let's maybe start uh, with that. So Delta Two Alpha makes uh, hard use products for people like us. First and foremost, uh, we make stuff that we wanted that uh, just hasn't come out yet. Um, yeah. So our but where uh, where we decided to go through and actually launch a launch form company, get a website out there was when we uh, when we get you Sarah, uh, which is our right. our first knife in a in a series of them uh, the h2 Sierra uh, came about my partner and I uh, we both grew up in a rural area uh, so I don't know if you can tell yeah. by my accent but I'm uh, I'm not necessarily city folk so <laughs> um, that's a good thing that's a good here, thing. Uh, it's, it's a thing for sure right depends on where you are um, right so right. growing up in the rural areas uh, my, uh, my partner and I, Dante, we, we had a similar origin story to the, uh, we were both raised by, uh, by, uh, by, uh, the older generation. What I mean by that is, uh, my grandfather was 42 when my father was born. He was born in 1910. So my, my wow. father was raised by the generation that raised the greatest generation. And so I grew up hearing, uh, hearing phrases like, you got to pull your weight, you got to earn your salt. And, uh, and all, all, all sorts right. of cheery things like the world doesn't care if you think it's fair. Uh, 
<laughs> I think I would have gotten along with him pretty uh, well. Well, it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so my uh, my father uh, called me and my brother over one day when I was about six years old and said, uh, come here, boys. And he just come home from the hardware store um, up in Canada. It was a, it was a co-op. So he right. uh, he called us over. He said, "Hold out your hands." And he put a he put what we called the jackknife. It was a uh, old style um, locking blade. It locked on the uh, locked on the spine. It had the uh, lock mechanism was a bar that uh, uh, rotated near the heel to release it. And he said, "You're young men now." And nice. right and and every every man needs a knife. And so when when I tell people in the city that they're they're like oh you know it must have been really violent. the the idea of a knife being oh, used man. as a weapon is uh, it's it's asinine uh, armed armed is a mindset of, of of course it could be used as a weapon but um, I I use a knife every day um, I just open boxes yeah. I right like it's uh, I'm when whenever I'm in uh, places where I can't carry one I always find that I need to use it. And, and that's right. pretty uh, pretty standard. And, pe- and people, like, they, they see it in different areas, and they, they all view them differently. And it's a very it's a very charmed society that we live in when people can have this, this right. fear of knives and weapons because they don't actually need to do any work, and they are so far removed from violence that the idea of something that could be a weapon is just this novelty. Uh, and my, uh, my partner and I, uh, he, his, his story is almost identical. Um, right. And, well, you know, I did an article for you guys. Uh, on, I mean, I I did an article about you guys uh, a, lo- a while ago uh, for my site, and I, you know, it, just because I, I, you know, I don't even remember how we first got into contact, but I think somehow, you know, you told me a little bit about the story, and I, sure. I just, I just really, I, I found it really kind of inspirational because manufacturing is a whole different. You know, the, everyone wants to talk about oh, you know, online businesses and get you get your dot com up and do this and do that, but to actually manufacture a product, a high quality, and this is, a, and I've seen these, these, these are not, <laughs> this is not, you know, selling an ebook or something. This is an actual product. I mean, a, a high quality, an actually, you know, engineered knife. And I think you guys went to Italy to do that. Absolutely. I mean, how, tell us about, how did you, how did you, I don't know, go about the design process? I mean, I, I those are the details I, I to me, you're just fascinating. Uh, absolutely. So my, uh, my background coming out of high school, I was trained as a machinist, so I have a, I have a pretty good idea as to how how tools actually work. Um, and whenever we seek to solve a problem, uh, we go through and we look at how that problem was historically solved, um, because there's right few problems are brand new, so we'll go through and we'll look at the right. classic designs. We'll look at what it was, what it was was being used years ago. Um, and then we go through and we talk to the people that use them and say, what did you not like about this? What did you like about it? And we go through and we make, uh, we make small changes. Uh, we make those tweaks. And what I, what I can tell you is uh, God is in the details or the absence of God is in the details if you're an atheist. Um, those, those small things can make a huge difference. So yeah. we went through uh, some, some people describe our, uh, our knife as a, as a tanto. Uh, or a Warncliffe, we describe it as a reverse yeah. tanto. So, uh, on our knife, there is a uh, the tip leads, um, and then we, right, yeah, and so that's taken from uh, from a standard utility knife design. It's it's a box cutter, um, and so by going through having that point at 45 degrees, uh, as soon as it comes in contact, it starts to bite. It draws material into it. Uh, we combine that with a uh, slight concave edge versus a, a convex edge that is commonly, uh, commonly seen. So that is, it is dished versus uh, uh, rounded outward. What the effect when you combine yeah. those two things are is it it, it effectively uh, uh, draws work into the edge and it makes the knife seem sharper than it is. Um, wow. And I mean, yeah, I mean that's. And you know, just so listeners can get an idea of what knives look like, I, I should say here that your website is it's a D E L T A and number two uh, A L P H A dot com. So delta two alpha dot com, and you can get you know the, an idea of what these these works of art really look like. I mean, uh, under the section of the H two Sierra, and you know, Paul, I mean, you're, you know. There's the idea that oh I you know I, I want to get the Chinese knockoff for 19.99. Well, you're not going to these are these are pieces of of uh, 
you know, it's a premium boy, and people need to understand that. That's that. But, you know, it's certainly that's worth a, it. a very good. Uh, our our we're, we're in of making throwaway stuff, um, and it's not common for the contact. Uh, like people I know, or people to contact, be like, well, you know, your your knife is three hundred dollars, and I could just go and I get, like, I I could pay ten dollars and I get thirty of them. And I say, yeah, that's true. And it, right, and 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 initially we tried to defend the position of what we were doing and, and stuff like that and justifying and, and and instead we would just wait and they'd say well like aren't you aren't you gonna say anything about that and I said well I said do you know what a high-end pony is and they would say well yeah it's you know it's a it's kind of a, a crappy Korean car and I said yeah I said, you, you, you drive into the ground you maybe change the oil twice in its entire life and then you throw it away and and, and and they're like yeah I said okay do you know what an Aston Martin Vanquish is and they're like yeah well <laughs> no, I said okay. Well, well, they're both cars, but that's kind of where the comparison stops. Uh, and if if well, you know, I'm so glad that you had that philosophy, uh, Ace, because man, you know, this what this world needs more of than anything is is the concept of of high quality, and we've got to get away from the clickbait, from the bullshit, from this disposable mentality. You know, there is a market for this, and uh, you know, this is what I would want if I was going to be looking for a knife that I was going to be taking out if I did a lot of camping mm -hmm. or if I did a lot of hunting. I mean, just as a digression here, I don't, I, I, it just looks like the way this is designed, this seems like it would be the ideal sort of a skinning knife. I mean, I could, I feel like I could just open up the belly of a, of a, of a uh, uh, you know, of something that, uh, you know, an animal that you may have captured or killed. It just, it just, that the way that point just juts out like that, you know, I just want to, it just seems like it's designed. I mean, I don't know if that's what you had in mind, but it, it looks like it. It, it it's, it's hungry. Really? It works very, very well. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, you know, never apologize. That one thing. You know, if you're interpreting all products, people always know the difference. And it's different than anyway. You don't, you don't want them. Some knucklehead who's going to say, "Well, you know, I can just, uh, you know, get this or something." Uh, you know, no, you don't. Those people show no. And I, now the design of it. Let me. Get, I, I thought you had said something to me earlier about you actually did. You went to Italy to, to actually find. A, you talked to cutlery and knife Abs makers, absolutely. right? Am I right yeah, about absolutely. that? Absolutely. That's fantastic, man. Tell me some. Let, let's hear. I want to hear that story. So we uh, we went through and uh, looked in some contacts, uh, did some research. Uh, the, the knife industry it's very very common. Um, just basically export everything uh, to third world economies. Uh, and fourth world economies trying to be third world economies, and if they could, right? right. Um, so one of our big philosophies is on keeping dollars in the West, right? Because our manufacturing base is right. it's declining. And having spoken with people from uh, Malaysia, from China, it's it's kind of a laughing stock for them, right? Like it's a joke that it's all soft service over here. So we said, well, you know what? We're going to put our money where our mouth is. We don't need to make that, you know. Um, that huge markup. We want to deliver a quality product. Uh, we want to we want to be fair with our manufacturer. We want to fair our customer, and we want to go through and put a quality product out. So uh, we dealt with. Uh, we wound up getting in touch with a company uh, out of Maniago, Italy, or Maniago. That's great. Uh, That's great. Fo man. Fox Knives. Uh, G uh, Gabriella and his dad. Um, they've. I mean, it's a multi-generational company. Uh, they they're doing their work with CNC. Uh, so the precision everything's done with is just unreal. Uh, we, we wound up getting them over, like getting yeah. back, and they had, uh, you know, a phosphorus bronze washer in them uh, to smooth out the action. Uh, they went through and impregnated uh, the, con uh, the point of contact with the liner and the blade interface to lock it up. That's, yeah. uh, it's impregnated with carbide dust. Um, and so the effect of that is, is it doesn't really wear. So I've seen, I, I've seen people take one of our knives out of the box, and I mean, good on them, uh, went through, opened it up, <laughs> and started smashing the spine of it into a metal bench. And I'm like, well, I wouldn't have done that with mine, but hey, that worked great. And the, the lock stood up, and the quality. You know, that, that's, you know, one of the things, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Ace, but one, one of the things that I've noticed about Orchard is, like you said, almost all of the medium-sized firms over there are family-owned, like these multi-generational companies, whether they're tailors, uh, you know, manufacturers, or all these sort of family business. And, and crafts, craftsmanship has a centuries-old tradition over there. I, I just noticed that with everything. I mean, you you name it with book binding, with 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 art, with illustrating, with uh, with you know clothing, with shoes, and uh, you know I, I'm just 
I know, especially imagine going back to the Renaissance, and there were all these different, just from what I've seen in, in old books, there were dozens of different knife designs, like I think Puglio, Puglios, I don't know exactly what they were called, but they had the, all these different types of daggers and knives, uh, firearms, the same thing. So I, I, I would have thought there were ways to do this. Yeah, well, just, just just the quality, but also, as you're pointing out, an old world, later, old world craftsmanship. Uh, for, for, further yeah. to your point about pride, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, companies in Europe, it's, uh, it's the family name that's tied to it, right? So, um, or, right. right, and so when we start looking at a company like Fox, that name may have changed, but everyone in the region uh, knows it as that family's company. And so my, my father growing up um, and that older, that older kind of idea of, you know, you, you don't wreck the family name. And so they really stand behind their work. Uh, any, any issues that, that come up, they're, they're right there to, to resolve them because they, they can't be that faceless company. Um, and they don't want to besmirch the name. And you guys did this, you and Dante, your partner, you guys did this all without any, uh, you know, business school degree or any of the approval from the mainstream or any um, you know the endorsement from the powers that but you guys just thought it up and just did this right uh, at a certain at a certain point you just have to do it and we it's fantastic we, we said well That's this great. is this is something we want so uh, we went through and found found somebody to do the do the prototype great I went through and drew up uh, I could. Sh uh, I'll send you. I'll see if I can dig up the original drawings. I'll send you a picture. The original drawings are done on loose leaf. Uh, I, 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 I hand bathed them. Right. We we went through. We met with a knife maker who's actually interestingly enough a, a high school shop teacher, and he's been building knives for 25 years. And said, okay, well this guy's been building knives for 25 years. He probably knows more than we do. And so let's go through work with him, and. Uh, and, and get the prototype, and we really liked it, and we said, okay, well, is right? do we want to take this to the next step, right? Like, do we want to make it so that other people have this? And people kept asking for them, so went through and did that. Uh, for us, it was very important that we were able to finance all of this without taking a loan. Um, and the reason yeah. for that was as soon as you're indebted to somebody, as soon as you start paying interest, we have to start behaving as a company um, in ways in which we need to pay that interest back, right? We we, we need to go through and make right. make decisions that are hasty and that are kind of uh, penny wise but pound foolish. We you know we we, we uh, start going through and uh, shortchanging the customer and things like that, and we, we just weren't willing to. So we uh, we said, hey, we're going through we're doing this run. Who wants one? Here's the retail, but we're going to go through and we're going to knock 30% off the top. So. The majority of the people that were going to mine for these, they were they were people we knew, and so I said, okay, well, we're going to go through, give them a chance to get a good deal, um, and we're going to go through and back it that way. So we essentially did our own uh, crowdfunding, and wow. that was how we financed. That's great. Yeah, I'm I, I'm just so happy that you guys. You know, I, I you know, because when I, when I first found out about you guys, because I'm not, I don't have uh, a lot of experience hunting, or I I just don't really do it on a regular basis. But what really attracted me to you guys. Just the fact that you had the balls to go do something. You had an idea, you thought up and you did it. And that to me is a lesson. Whether, you, whether you're making can openers mm -hmm. or whether you're making, um, you know, tooled leather, I don't know, uh, you know, aprons, it doesn't matter to me. Um, I mean, I, I do like weapons. I guess that's kind of one of the things that I, I what caught my eye the years. Because, you know, I remember visiting the uh, the Japanese uh, sword muto. All the blades are... are like this, I mean, they're hundreds of years old, but they look like they were just made yesterday because the main, t the the steel is so is so incredibly high quality, man. You know that um, the kind of impression I got here. It's just I just like weapons and I like good craftsmanship. I, I could see that when I saw the pictures of your, your knives here. So one um, of the one of the things that you really have to have with European swords is the Japanese sword was incredibly sold because you, it, like if you take two, uh, if you take European sword, they come out of Spain really. Um, all quality, uh, right, all two and look the same, and you take one and get a it, the same for the United States, the 1700s probably would would give you a cross section. If you go over and you take the period right. from here and period from the two different places, the, the quality of steel that happens is junk. Um, and so what they were able to do with it um, really, really speaks to the quality of the craftsmanship they had. Uh, the, the, the European swords from that, from that period, they just had way better steel to start with. Um, so when you go through and you compare the quality of the uh, of the products going in versus the end product, you get uh, you get a, a fairly equal product. Um, but going through and it's like okay, the, right? The 
when, when the Japanese swordsmith would look at it and say, okay, well, we need to go through and have the core be a lot harder, uh, and then we need to laminate kind of softer still on the outside, because otherwise this thing's just going to shatter. And so how they would do that, the differential hardening, it, it's very, very impressive. Very impressive. Well, the yeah, I mean, from what I've read about um, about the swordsmithing that went on over there, uh, even now we don't know a lot of the techniques from what I've read. Apparently, there's th a lot of these guys were so secretive in their methods, and the apprenticeships were so closely guarded that we don't really know a, a lot of the ways. But I think what they really focused on was the folding and the beating of the steel. Mm -hmm. I guess getting all those impurities out Absolutely. of it, folding, beating, folding, and beating, uh, literally thousands of times. I mean, much more than you would find. I think the closest thing, I guess, the Damascus swords, the, the Damascus blades <clears throat> were apparently also up there, but, um, uh, you know, it's, um, it's just really interesting, you know, it's just really interesting, and I guess, I would, I would expect that most of your, your customers are probably going to be maybe outdoorsmen, hunters, I don't, is this, I mean, is this really a soft or more utilitarian, utilitarian type of so what I'll tell you is, um, first and foremost, any in major area needs to do standard box as well. Uh, there's just a small favor in there, and uh, we're going to see some of the sea pop gums. I'm surprised at just like how much weight people are carrying. They have, they have pistols, they have knives all over the place, and uh, you, you go through and you look at a, a knife like Karambit. Um, so I go through and I take out the uh, Karambit to just use it for something. Well, I don't want people having this visceral response because I have this, this huge claw. So first and foremost, our knife is designed to be used. It's designed to solve problems. Yeah. So uh, one of the stories we got recently was from a fellow out of Florida, um, and he is um, uh, he is referred to a full service concierge. So what that means is when the team come to uh, come to Florida, uh, he takes care of the team. Right? So guys are around taking this work, whatever right. they require, full service. So uh, he's a good contact of ours. We wound up uh, we wound up getting him one of our blades. And I talked a couple of weeks ago, and he was telling me that he actually wound up using it. Right? There's a car on the freeway. <laughs> car, car on the freeway rolled over. <laughs> thing was starting to smoke, starting to go on fire. Took out his H2 Sierra, smashed the window, right? Cut the seat belt, pulled the one the one out, went around to the other Damn, side, smashed dude. the window with, right? Because it like like it's got some heft to it, right? Smashes the window, cuts the seat belt, pulls this person out, and work. Holy work, shit, that's like great, a dam. Um, we've we've talked to people who have gone through and like you you wind up with a, a fracture of the lower leg, um, where uh, where you need to go through and. Uh, uh, so open fracture bone sticking out, right, where they need to go through and actually oh, get yeah. to to assess it. Well, that blade design allows you to actually get up inside the pant leg and uh, with a lot of control. Drop yeah, back. see, that's what I like about, I mean, my, my eyes just keeps getting drawn to this point on that blade. <laughs> I just, I want to stick that inside, the, man. I mean, that, the amount that point, of, the amount of just, control, yeah. right? So yeah. uh, for, for me, the big thing is the utility side of it. Uh, what I'll tell you is uh, the uh, special interest groups, that we've talked to, um, and of many of these guys have contacted us, and they purchased this with their own money. Uh, when they're getting back to us, uh, they they are telling the, us that it does everything that they needed to, and more than they expected it to. Uh, and I'm not really going to go through and glorify that too much, but it it does that it does the the kind of self defense thing really really well. Yeah. Um, you mean like security or law enforcement or security people? Uh, L or LEO, PMC, uh, military. Um, there's uh, yeah. some guys. Yeah, some some guys all over. Um, and it's one of those things where the guys that are in the know, the guys that are using it, are saying this is it. Um, from from a self defense standpoint, uh, our handle is quite large. So somebody going through just using it like a roll of nickels, like uh, like the old man tie, or going through and using it like a cubaton, or just using it to beef up some type of hammer fist. It can be used for all that. Um, well, I'm I'm sh I'm looking at the specs here, and I I can see the handle length is in 134.3 millimeters. How many inches is that? I'm, do you happen to know? Because I'm just uh, as an American, I'm, <laughs> you know, sometimes I I find myself metrically challenged. Um, uh, so <laughs> it's so it's roughly uh, roughly 25.4 millimeters to an inch. Okay. Um, okay. So that, that that's so it's about five six. Um, Somewhere. So there, so there's a fellow online um, by the name of Phil Elmore. Phil Elmore is commonly known as the Marshallist. Uh, I've met Phil in person. Um, Phil, Phil's hilarious, um, really, really articulate, uh, professional writer himself. Um, and so nice. he has a bare paw for a hand. I have a large woman's hand. He has like a large man's hand. And when he grabs this thing. Um, uh, the, the, the the pictures uh, would be on the marshallist.com where you can see it, but when he grabs a hold of this thing, um, 
it easily sticks out both ends. With that said, uh, we major our blade in terms of three inches, and the length of the blade is three seven, so that will ruin the majority of the uh, sub four inch uh, carry laws. Uh, right. But depending on how it is, it's interpreted. We want to make sure that the entire blade length was less than four inches. Um, and then the sharpen right. edge was kind of in addition to, because the last thing we need is somebody reinterpreting it and then so on and so forth. So with that said, we need to make sure that there was, that there was enough, enough handle to get purchase on. So the design of our handle is a little bit fatter in the center. It necks down, and then it gets fat at the end. So uh, the effect is opposed to like a finger groove, which is going to feel really good on my hand, but maybe not on yours, right? It winds up being a very individual thing. With the design that we have, you can really grip on that knife and yeah. you have a stop and for, for people that have used knives a lot what they know is if you don't have a, like a good solid handle if you have a small handle you'll cut yourself with small knives that's just the way it happens so yeah. if if I'm going through and doing work um, I want to have that full purchase uh, the handle set up so it's three dimensionally symmetrical so if I'm going through and working on it in a traditional just kind of draw uh, point forward edge down um, I'm going through and cutting leather. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is, uh, is is leather work. So as an example, I've braided whips and stuff like that. And when uh, when you start going through and working with those heavier materials, you need a lot of control in that point. Um, and so to be able to do that without getting your elbow way up in the air, uh, it's just more ergonomic. Uh, conversely, if you have that point forward and you roll it over and it's edge up because you need to open up some type of a feed bag or something like that, um, as you go through, you can put it up and draw it towards you, uh, opening that up, right. putting that pressure there. But here's the thing. It feels the same way in your hand either way you're holding it. Uh, if somebody winds up, uh, you know, winds up in a situation where they where they need to use it combatively, uh, and I mean, we we really hope that that ever has to happen for anyone. But if, if they do, right, uh, they do. So if they're holding it edge in, uh, edge in point down in a reverse grip it feels the same um, if you go through and have it edge out point uh, point down it feels the same as the right so the four major grips that you're gonna hold the knife right. to really do that work is right it's gonna lock up well for you it's gonna feel really solid really robust and uh, and, and that, that's huge if, if you are in a self-defense situation the last thing that you want is to have something that feels flimsy in your hand uh, right. our handle is uh, uh, our handle's rounded, so if if any of your readers were to check the pocket of, uh, where they're carrying their knife, or go and look at a steak knife, or go and look at some knives in stores, uh, and I highly recommend that they do this, um, and you look at the side of the knife, what's referred to as the scale. So there's the blade, there's the handle, and the pieces that are typically textured are called the scale. What you'll notice is they're flat, and so what typically happens is they take uh, a water jet or a CNC router, and they zip all of these out. And then what they'll do is, uh, typically if they're using a router, is they'll use a radius bit, and they'll just cut a radius so it's so it's flat and it's rounded on the corners, um, which is a fast and cheap right. way to do it. For us, ours is, uh, like our handle is actually a convex. So the difference is, when I grip onto that thing, I have more contact on my palm. I have a better purchase. What I'll tell you is to go through and have a CNC tool go around and around and around and create that convex. Uh, it takes time, and time on a CNC is money. Yeah. So yeah, we can flatten them out. When you, when you go through and you start looking at a lot of choices that mass manufacturers are doing, um, they're making business uh, business decisions. Um, I am I'm a user yeah. first, so I'm making I'm making a knife that I need. I'm making the knife that I want, and other people can, right. And uh, I totally agreed, man. I mean, just as a layman looking at the I mean, quality matters yes. in everything. And as I've got the older I get, the more I appreciate the fact that I, I just don't it's just not worth it in the long run to, to skimp on stuff, especially as something as intimate and as necessary as a, as a knife. You don't you don't want to same thing with, you know, with uh, with, well, I guess, almost anything, you know, especially, you know, people want to go out and uh, get, you know, the the cheapest this or the cheapest that and it, the same thing applies to services too you know you really get what you pay for you want to you want to go hire a knucklehead to do a job and then then people wonder why they get problems you know and it's it's uh it's just a it's it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a, a way of looking at the world that I think we need to 
really uh, reevaluate because there's too much of that. Well, there, there, do it yourself, there, there's the addiction to cheap to, to cheap goods and services, right? That's that's yeah. that's one of the biggest problems in the in in the West and Western a Western company trying to stay in the West. Um, there's a, there's a company based in San Francisco called Triple Lot Design, and Triple Lot Design I've been following for about nine or ten years. Uh, having got a chance to meet the the people behind it, one of the things that's fascinating is the manufacturing that they were doing overseas has all been pulled back to North America. So that so great. they're getting like as an example, they have a pair of blue jeans which are they're fantastic jeans. Um, they are made in uh, North Carolina or South Carolina. The denim comes from a denim mill in North uh, North or South Carolina. Uh, good, they're good. they're going through and they uh, they're uh, I, I believe it's their their stealth hoodie. Um, they're oh, yeah. right. They're they're yeah. getting it made in Vancouver, British Columbia. So when when you go through and you start looking, it's like okay, there are companies that are waking up and they're coming back and they're saying no, we're going to produce quality. Uh, they they are. Dude. I'm telling you, it's it's it's, it's such a trade. I don't mean to cut you off, but I'll I'll throw you a yeah. story that uh, kind of similar to what you guys mm-hmm. did, what you and Dante did. I've got a business partner. You know, he's a, a law partner. Uh, you know, we've got a been been have we've had a law office now for about 16 years and you know we've always had that same philosophy you know we don't we don't we're not going to get into the uh the race to the bottom that's what i call a race to the bottom you know trying to outbid the you know the dorks and the bottom feeders and whatnot it's just a losing it's a losing game man Mm -hmm. because you know it it makes you pissed off it makes you not want to do a good job Mm -hmm. um you know but yet with with that you get you're always you, you know you the, the the quality of the responsiveness, the immediate, the service, the calling back immediately, mm-hmm. the all those little extras that people really, you know, in a in a world where you can't even get somebody on the phone, hardly to solve a problem, it's a it's a big that that type of thing is a big deal for me. Being instant responsiveness. But anyway, what I was really what I was trying to get at was not so much that, but you know, my uh, my law partner, he's got a friend who used to be a computer programmer. Okay. And at one point, I guess he just got sick of doing that. And he decided to design bags, like, you know, uh, uh, what are they called? Um, messenger nice. bags. You know, these bags, like these, uh, you know, people carry them around with them. And I guess they put stuff in them. I don't really use them, but I guess people do. And I guess he did this all in his own basement. He just designed these messenger bags. And everybody told him he was delusional. They said, oh, you know, the people can go buy those in China at, uh, they can get those at Walmart or they can get them at Target for, uh, 20 bucks. Why? Why would they buy yours? Well he, well, he didn't. He didn't listen to that nonsense. He went and did it, and he designed, I guess, the best messenger bag that you can get. And he charged top dollar. I think these bags cost a couple hundred bucks, you know. But but he's, he, uh, you know, and he um he just recently, I guess, started a, a set up a opened up a little shop, I guess, and I think it was in. Uh, Indiana or Nebraska, I don't forget exactly what state it, it, it's in, but uh, you know, he hires like five or six people to, to do it. But I guess the point is a kind of a similar, a guy who, you know, had the vision to, to produce a, a high quality product domestically and didn't listen to what the naysayers said. And there's a market for it. And I guess he just got a write up. I guess he really exploded from what I understand. He just got a write up some magazine and he, then he was in the New York Times. He was everywhere. Good for him. So it all Thanks. that's all that's all you need is is a break. All you need is someone to notice your product. Uh, and, and you know we're you know guys like me you know we want to help you out. We we want to see you succeed because, damn man, this 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 type of story just they just fire me up. I and I and I mean that. And I'm not even a knife user really. I mean I've got an old K bar from my military days and classic. I keep that classic. sharp and oh I love dude man gripping that leather pommel man and you talk about smashing the windshield <laughs> you turn that thing you know the, that that metal that the uh, on the top of the pommel is like a, a metal uh, there's, there's a name for the I don't know what it's called but there's a um, uh, I don't know what the hell it's called but there's the, the, the top of the pommel of the of the knife is a, like a, a metal knob mm-hmm. for lack of a better word uh, but anyway it's a stab it's a great all around stabbing cutting utility weapon but so anyway the so point, the, on on the, on on the topic of the k-bar um our knife handle right like so so when you grip a hold of that k-bar i don't know if you're one of those guys that has it on your on your desk but when you grip a hold of that and that's round right and it just fills your hand 
No, oh, it just feels great. I, right? just, so, <laughs> it's, it's, so, I don't know why it does. It's, it's, it's like it walking around right. with just wood. You know, <laughs> that's 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 the thing. Yeah. Is it is it just feels right? And so when you go through and you look at the K, you look at the K bar, you look at the uh, the right the, fair, the uh, coming out of the uh, the OSS right Campex, um, uh, W Fairbairn, uh, Sykes, Applegate. You look at the knives coming out of there, right? And you see this round handle. You see this symmetrical yeah. handle, so that K bar is going to feel right. Whatever grip you're using it, and it feels the same. So that so when yeah. I was talking earlier yeah, about classically looking at what the classics were doing, that's an example, yeah. right? So we went through and said, okay, well, hey, that's good. How can we make it better? And so so with yeah. that, we took okay, well, bulbous in the center, that's good. But let's go through and make it so that if their hand does start to run up, they got a speed bump there. Um, but also a folding knife too is going to be better for. I mean, the K bar is great for obviously for military use or if you're going to go out hiking or camping but i would think that a folding knife is going to be better for all around uh, you day, know, day to day carries the convenience the of it absolutely yeah that's what i would I mean, you can't really you can't carry around you can't carry around a k bar but well you you um, can i guess you can <laughs> yes you can <laughs> but uh but no I, I you know the these these type i think the the returning of quality back to north america hopefully will be a uh, a continuing trend and and um i'm really glad that you and others are are doing stuff like that and all you need is your your big break man you know all you need is uh, like one big contract maybe from uh you know any agency or company or get a write-up in a magazine so you know get the word out there you know get it uh get it get it out there keep um you know your, your best word of mouth is going to be your your satisfied customers so um but anyway, I I, um, I know we could talk for hours here. Ace, I know we uh, could. But, um, I want to I want to try to keep it down to a reasonable minimum. But you'll have to check in with us here, maybe in a couple months, and give us an update on how how things are going. But uh, I uh, I appreciate your, your yeah I appreciate your being on the podcast. I know it's a big time difference for us here. But um, if um, uh, there, there, there's something that just came up the uh, the other day, uh, we're we're sponsoring an event that's happening. And uh, uh, do, do you mind if I talk about that just for a few minutes? Sure, sure, yeah. Talk away, go for it. Okay, man. so there's a no there's a group on Facebook called Ed's Manifesto. Um, uh, Ed is the uh, the director of training in Mexico City for a, a knife fighting system called Libre. Um, they're doing a lot of uh, a lot of counter custody stuff, um, a lot of where kidnapping is happening for for, pe- for oh, people yeah. that are traveling. Yeah. Um, uh, Ed's background is he uh, he runs around Mexico dealing with the cartels, um, wow. and for 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 the government, right? He does a very very good job, and uh, the stuff that's out there, the stuff that he's seeing, uh, it's basically going through and, and adding to it. So, um, great great project he's got going on. Um, the the Libre stuff, right? It's it's going through and looking at uh, looking at the user side of it, uh, and one one of kind of my big uh, my big complaints with the martial arts world, and I've I've been doing martial arts for years. It's it's a passion. I enjoy the, I enjoy the movement, right? I enjoy the chess game of of, uh, of a nice technical jujitsu rule, um, but uh, when we start getting into in, into combatives and into the knife stuff, especially, there's this idea that um, somebody controls a brand, right? That there's this this exclusivity on who owns violence and how to do it. And so what's yeah. what's really interesting, refreshing from uh, from the Libre from the Libre guys, um, and which is headed up by Scott Bapp. Um, they studied what criminals were doing. They were taking a user standpoint. Said, "Okay, well, what what are these guys doing? Like, we, we need to first understand the enemy before we can fight them." Uh, and right. they're they're just doing great stuff, uh, great great stuff. Um, and they're and they're doing it down in TJ, and they're doing it because uh, they're not filling people's heads full of delusions as far as what is going to happen and what they're what they're going to go through. Like, there's a lot of people in North America doing feel good stuff. And so yeah. the advantage of them being down in Tijuana is uh, how psychologically demanding. Oh, that's reality. Uh, well, they, yeah. they can make it pretty psychologically demanding, you know. So yeah. uh, now, in, in as a, a page for this or a website? For yeah. This? So it, Facebook yeah, page can... is uh, is Ed's Festo, um, exactly how you think it's spelled. Um, Ed's man. Okay, with no apostrophe, just E D S. Uh, e D uh, apostrophe S, right? Ed's manifesto. Uh, okay. Ed is in like Eduardo, um, okay. and just. 
a lot of great content. But what's uh, what's neat is they don't pull punches. Hey, this is what's happening, right? Here, here's these people that were kidnapped, and here's how they got away. Here's these people that were kidnapped and they didn't get away. Here's some of the stuff you're going to be subjected to, and actually going through and just this is this is the real world that we're living in, and and have right. You go through and you look at uh, places like Sinaloa. Uh, kidnapping's a business, yeah. and so oh, yeah. so anyone that thinks that that doesn't happen in 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 the West. I mean, we, we live in a privileged time, but there are there are entities, right? The cartels are operating uh, across the border now, and those things are starting to happen. Um, yeah. Just well, I'm glad. Now, and so you're going to be involved in this now, or you have friends that are running this? So, so we're we're sponsoring the event, um, going okay. down there, um, and, and just just really happy to do what we can to see a project like that grow, uh, because well, that's, it's real. Well, that's certainly. I mean that's that's uh, where the rubber meets the road. I mean people always want to talk about foreign wars and foreign conflicts, but it's easy to forget that uh, right uh, south of the border uh, of the United States border is a a nation that's been dealing with a, a literally a war for the past decade, which probably has claimed the lives of upwards of seventy thousand, maybe even more people. It, it so would be hard is, to say. It'd be hard to put a number on it. Like, yeah, no, lots. no joke, no joke. So you guys are you guys are in there in the mix you guys are where the rubber meets the road and i i respect that so we will keep following that situation ace and again i wish you and dante the best of luck with delta 2 alpha knives the best knife that you'll ever get in a folding system innovative design uh, started from scratch just by two guys who had a mission and a passion Um, so ace thank you for joining if yeah, if, I... if if any of your uh, any of your customers any of your fans out there decide that they want one, uh, going through the store, put in the coupon code Gordon, and it'll uh, it'll knock some uh, knock some cash off that for them. We uh, we like to go through and give uh, give value to people when we can and and add uh, add some to your fan base for you. And that's at the website, right? For yeah, Delta Two yeah. Alpha dot com. Absolutely. Okay. So when they're going through shopping Gordon. carts, there'll be a coupon code. Put in Gordon. And if anyone's wondering, it's like police commissioner gordon fantastic <laughs> all right well <laughs> i'm sure they won't forget that absolutely i'm sure the joker will, will the joker would be proud so all right well listen thank you ace for uh joining us here and we will have to talk to you again soon keep the fires burning and best of luck to you absolutely all right take care, take care. bye-bye and that will wrap it up for us here with another podcast at fortress of the mind publications. I want to thank you for joining us. And if you enjoyed this podcast, I would ask that you go to iTunes and rate me on iTunes. It'll help us get noticed. And for all of you out there who are cultivating a passion for business enterprises, I hope you've learned and gotten something out of the podcast tonight. I know I have. And until next time, I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night.